Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Welcome to the Metal Voice. Alan, we got, oh, we got the greatest, one of the greatest oh. metal singers of them all. <laughs> nah, nah. <laughs> It's only been like 10 years I wanted to do this interview. Jimmy, you've had the occasion to interview Michael here for a few occasions, and this is my first. And, and this is monumental because this is officially the earliest interview we've ever done in the metal voice. I got my coffee here this morning because this is the earliest interview this we've ever done. This is my fourth coffee right now. It's 8 in the morning here. <laughs> What's your time right now? 8, eight. in the morning. That's not early. <laughs> on, a, on a day off. <laughs> I always wake up. I mean, I'm, I suck the last five days. I don't know what happened. It's gotten really hot here, and I couldn't, I couldn't fall asleep for like two nights, and now my rhythm is screwed up. I slept till like 9.30, which I haven't done for years. Normally, <laughs> without a, an alarm clock, I, I usually wake up around 5, 6 in the right. morning, you know, and I just wake up, get a coffee. That's just my rhythm, and it's completely screwed up. But 8 o'clock to me. It's already a lost day. Ah. Yes, there you go. <laughs> so we got, you know, the first I wake up early too, Michael. Just so you know, we wake up like six. It's just, this is the earliest interview. Like our voices aren't actually working, you know, at this time. Uh -huh. You know what we mean? Yeah. I wake up very often at five. Yeah. At five. It's because we're yeah. old. Without an alarm clock. Yeah. But, but not now. The last couple of days, everything's screwed up. I think I got to set an alarm clock. I, I got to force myself to get back into the rhythm. You know? All right. And, and you know what? Let's let's quickly, let's talk about, I don't know how much time we have, but let's quickly talk about the oh, fine. Halloween self-titled album. It's been, I, Alan, I didn't do the math. How many years has it been since Michael's been in the band? Michael? Too long. Too long. Too long. Too Are you long. Mean, mean the first time? Yes, 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 yes. That is... I, I was no longer part of the band in 94. So, like, from 94 on, um, January 94, I was out, you know. You know, 35 years the band's been existed. And, and you know, back in the day, metal, we're buying the Maidens, we're buying the Priest. Oh, here's this little EP from Halloween before you joined the band. and But then looking back now, the first, you know, the Keeper album, I couldn't believe it was like 88 when that was released. It, yeah. it seems to me it was a lot earlier in the 80s. And, you no. know, stuff was starting to change by then. So Yeah, yeah it was, it was uh, I think... 87 was Keeper 1, and 88 was Keeper 2. Well, yeah. for me, it's just, I thought it was 84 or 85. I was very surprised looking back at it. It was really that late into the 80s that uh, you guys are really, really taking off. I thought it was it happened a lot earlier for you, so. I don't know. I mean, Halloween was there earlier. I mean, they started yeah. around 82, but, uh, but just the four of them with, uh, with a more punk kind of sound. All right, so let's yeah. let, tell us about you know, what was the moment that you said, you know what, I want to do this? I, and not only do I want to tour with these guys, but I want to record an album with these guys. Something not too many bands have done, like reunite all, most, at least most right. of the members, right? Tell us, I what think, was that defining moment? I think Van Halen tried it, but it didn't work out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. How many times? <laughs> No, with, with Hagar and uh, Diamond Dave. Yeah. They yeah, were trying yeah, to do yeah, something yeah. together. It didn't work out. With us, it worked out. It, there wasn't one moment uh, with everything, but there was one moment that changed my mind in general about an, an idea like that. Um, even that wasn't just a moment. I, it, to me, it, it, I mean, in the 90s, I would have rejected anything. It didn't matter. It didn't matter how much money you would have offered me. I would not want to do it. Uh, I was disappointed about the band. I was disappointed about the scene and everything. And I, I was at a, pretty much on a crusade, to be honest with you. And it was good for me. It was a good time. It was important. It shaped my personality. And I don't want to miss it. But that was in those 80, uh, 90s, sorry, in, in those 90s, nothing like that would would ever have been possible and my my kind of opening up to this type of music started with 
Avantasia actually it was at the end of the 90s. I think I think it was uh, 98 or 99 when when he was working on the first Avantasia album. He was he really talked me into it. Early. I didn't I didn't want to do it at first, but I liked him right away. As I, I, just the guy he is, you know. Uh, I am, and and he, he he convinced me to do it. That's why I'm earning you know, on, on the album because I, <laughs> I I wasn't a hundred percent sure, you know. If, uh, but I enjoyed it. And then later on, I make it short. Okay, later on, Serafino showed up, offered me uh, a deal for my solo stuff, and then he came with Plas Vendome, which which was great. I really enjoyed it, and it, it was getting into that direction a lot. And then. I got in touch through that with uh, Dennis Ward uh, and him together with Coster a, a few years later offered the idea of making a real band, you know, and they were both getting nowhere with Pink Cream 69. I was basically just on my own you know, doing some stuff here and there. And um, they thought it would be a good idea to make a real band, which, which it was. And then on the first Avantasia tour, I didn't, I didn't go with them. But on the second one, Costa told me, because we were planning to tour with Unisonic, he said, you should go on that Avantasia tour just to get a feel back. Right. Um, and it's, it was a perfect situation, not only because of the guys, you know, being very sweet guys and, and very easy going and everything was pretty stress free, but also because of how little you had to do. I, I always consider this as paid holidays, really, because <laughs> you just travel the world and you sing, I don't know, how many songs? I, I don't sing one complete song. You know, it's it's just bits and pieces here and there. And it was perfect to get comfortable again and stuff. And on that first tour I did with them, I did more than one, but on the first one I did with them, Kai Hansen was part of it. So I was on stage with Kai again, and it was this old familiar way uh, of, of feeling on stage. It was this chemistry going on. And we, we started talking we should do something together. And I didn't want to join Gamma Ray. It's just not my cup of tea. So he joined Unisoni. So, so, so that was another step. And, uh, but still I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I was actually getting uh, a little pissed when I heard Andy say things like that uh, in an interview. He did some, I don't know where, when it was, but it was a friend of mine who has sent me a quote about something that, that Andy had said in an interview about, that he he's sure that in two thousand something you know I will be part of the of the team again and we we were gonna make a big tour and stuff. And I was like, what is he talking about? That's <laughs> <laughs> but it, it shows you how long they were planning that. You know, it was especially Andy, which is funny because he yeah. he was he's the action yeah. he wanted to do it, and and especially of course the management loves things like that. You know, but. It was Andy and Kai Hansen. They were like the driving force uh, behind it. And in 2013, I was on a, on a tour with Avantasia again in Europe. And in one of the festivals we played, I ran into Michael Wyckoff backstage. And he stood in front of me in a complete cuddle mode. <laughs> with a cigarette. Yeah. Beers. He doesn't breathe air. <laughs> no. <laughs> We found that out. We he found that out. Live by breathing air, it's not. It's not happening. But it's, but he, he stood in front of me and he said, which was perfect. You know, he, he said, "What have I done that you can't forgive me?" I mean, you can't be more like hard, straightforward. You know, mm. you, you just straight away unarmed. Yeah. And I was I was uh, I was I was holding my breath, and I noticed there was no more anger. I wasn't angry anymore. I, I was lingering on in my head, you know, because that's that's that was the situation for so many years. But in my soul, something had changed, you know, probably just by getting older. I don't know. But so my answer was, you know, I, I think I've forgiven you a long time ago because that's how it felt, you know, in that moment. But still, I, w I wasn't thinking about anything like that. But that was an inner game changer when it comes to to changing my or realizing something has changed you know and then like a year later we played three shows in spain with unisonic great shows the band was getting in shape you know we're it was good concerts really good good shows not nothing big maybe up to 2000 or something like that um and after one of those shows kai hansen looked at me and said you know what michael we just got to do something with Halloween once more, you know, before it's too late. And that's when I said, you know what? I'm open. 
and, and Costa was playing drums for Unisonic, as you probably know, and, and, and he was part of the management bottom row. So he passed that information over to Jan Bayati, who was the manager of Halloween, and he called me up and wanted, and wanted to check out how serious I was. And I must admit, at first, the only thing I really cared about, because I did not know the market, I, didn't, I did not have any, any idea of how successful this could be or anything. I didn't think about any, anything like that. I was, I was basically all about making peace, getting it out of my system, you know, making a tour with them and leaving as friends. You know, like if you, if you, if you can get rid of enemies and make them friends again, go for it. You know, it's a, it heals you. It's something off your chest. Um, so that was my main mo motivation in the beginning. Well, that ha that changed, you know, going on tour with them in 2017 and getting that feedback from the audience and the the spirit that 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 was always there every night uh, among us it was just so intense that um, things changed. Um, and after 2017, we all knew that this could last, that this could continue longer. Because we only made a tour uh, contracts for, for this tour in, in 2017. Because if we if we didn't get along, for, uh, you don't want to be forced to do that if you, you know, it makes you sick. So it's like, we only made contracts for, for this tour. But when everything went down so well, we started to think ahead. That's when the idea of an album came up. I'm sure Jan Bayadi had something like that in his mind already. I mean, that's his job, you know. As a manager, you 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 make your plans. But for us as musicians, musicians are always like that. You just live in the moment. You make the best out of the moment, and you 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 just make decisions out of how it feels, you know. And um, so, as you can tell, there was not one moment where where everything was clear. It was step by step, you know. Yeah, yeah that, my, we interviewed Michael too, and he was talking about that night that he walked. He said he had two or three beers in his hand, smoking with three or four cigarettes, like he always does. And he, he said, "There's no problem. We we move forward from that that point on." So it was good to see that uh, coming together. So yeah, of course. After that, Jan wanted me to have a long conversation with YT, which we did. We talked for maybe like two or three hours, and it was very interesting because you you couldn't you you realized there was nothing really going down it was just bullshit you know like in the 80s the typical ego kind of stuff and it was there was everybody has a different story everybody has a different story like it always is you know yeah and uh, but he, when everything was settled with Wikey, because he was actually the only one that i really had a problem with i never had a problem with kai i didn't like it when he left you know, uh, but I never had a problem with him. And I met him after that uh, in, a, in a music store and we talked. And then I sang a little bit on, on his Gamma Ray record. And he, with Adrian Smith, was, were helping me out on my first solo record. You know, so you can, and he was part of you. And the Sonic later on, you can see that there was never a problem. And, 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 and Marcus was basically sucked in by the situation. <laughs> and the rest of the, of the band, I, I didn't know. You know, they're, they're a new guy. So it was basically a thing between me and, and, and Wikey. And when that was settled, Jan wanted me to spend some time with Andy Darris because we didn't know each other. And he said very truthfully, if you guys don't get along, it doesn't make any sense. It's not, yeah. you know. And so I flew over to Tenerife and I spent about two weeks almost every day with him. He, he was taking me to various places. Uh, uh, restaurants and, and we, we, he has a he has a favorite place, very uh, like completely next to the to the to the beach to the sea to the, to the ocean, uh, where where they have a, a little restaurant where you, where you can get gambas like a special specially garlic roasted shrimps and stuff Ooh. which are pretty amazing actually. Um, to to make a long long story a little short, we got along perfectly. It was it was almost like I knew him, um, which is the most beautiful part of it because it's like when every time in the past centuries when I saw his face, it was not connected with a good feeling. It was that's that's the dude who got my job, you know. And the other way around, especially in the early years when he joined the band. 
he got a lot of fire, you know, from, from, from the fans who didn't agree with that. You know, it's always a very unthankful thing to do. Yeah, to yeah. point a band that has had, I mean, when Bruce Dickinson joined Iron Maiden, they were just in their beginnings and it really took off when he joined the band. That's when I got interested into Iron Maiden. You know, it was when, when he joined the band because it was his vocals that kind of knocked me off my feet. But it, it, it was, with with Andy, it was much more difficult because he he was he joined the band when we when we had like a lot of successes in the eighties, you know. So when he saw my face for the last centuries, it was probably not connected with the best feelings. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a situation created just out of the circumstances without us knowing each other, which is a funny situation, you know. And it was interesting, and we were we were nervous. I think. It, it, there was a, a an element of insecurity, but it was quickly gone, and it, and it was so interesting to see how how good we get along. It was really like like an old mate or someone I knew, and I I'm sure I know him from somewhere previous lives or whatever, you know. Um, wow. But when that went down well, that's when we started to make some real brainstorm sessions and 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 plans about this, you know. So, so what would so, you recommend? Sorry, Alan. What would you oh, just ahead. in one sentence? What would you tell those bands? You know, the Van Halens, the Iron Maidens. You know, all those bands who had so many members. What 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 would be the key to reuniting like Halloween did to them? The basis has to be the basis has to be on a human level. You know, it has to be because you want to make peace. You know, if you're just in there for another ego reason. Or whatever, it's not going to work. It's not going. It doesn't have any strength. It doesn't have any legs. It, it you know, uh, and that's you know, I was really, really happy. It really moved me. I love Sammy Hagar, just the guy he is. Okay, uh, and I, I love David, David Lee Roth too. I think he's a very misunderstood person. Where like in the in the last number of years, there was a lot of interviews where. Or like since the internet ages have become so dominant, I mean, you, you you can see you can get an impression about anyone. And when you when you when you look at the guy in interviews, he's not that arrogant jerk that we always thought he was. You know, <laughs> not at all. He just has a certain style of entertainment that he thinks is right. But he is very moral and he's very intelligent and, yeah. and he has depth. I was surprised. You know, it's like. And Sammy Hagar, to me, is also like a, a, a great guy. So it was not about it was not about um, um, you like that one better than the other one, you know. It was like they, they tried to do something like that with the, with the two singers, but it, but it didn't work out. But you know, I was really happy when when Eddie died that there was a video coming out. I was not happy when Eddie died, but I was happy to see a video from Sammy Hagar right after that saying that they actually talked like a couple of months before he died. Mm. They talked and they made peace and all that. It matters so much if you die and you take that with you. Yeah. You cannot fix it anymore. It's there. Only in time and space when we're here, we can change things. We can change the directions we move. We can make decisions and free choices. As soon as you're out of your body, I don't know if you're a spiritual person, but as soon as you're out of your body, that's it. You, you got to live with the fruits of your life and you got to do with it whatever you can. So I'm really happy that they sorted it out. You know, that, 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 I don't, I, I don't, I, I think even Sammy Hagar and David Lee Roth are fine now. I, I, I think they, they, they're pretty well, cool. Would, yeah. I, I saw that tour, the Sam and Dave tour, and it was, uh, you know, a little disappointing that they didn't uh, get together and try something. Uh, uh, it was a great show. I enjoyed it, but as you can tell, like you said, there was that, that yeah. friction that was throughout the whole tour, and it landed up with uh, headlining problems, and they just split at the end. But he but again, I think I think that's the way to go about it. Like you said, uh, you know, when Sammy Hager got back with Van Halen, I saw that tour as well, and, and I call that the Take the Money and Run tour because <laughs> it wasn't about the music at all. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It felt. It, you mean like when, when David was out? You mean in the nineties? Yeah, when Sam, the 90s. Sam we tried to get back with the brothers, and Eddie was going through a bit of a dark period. You mean the second time? Yeah, the second time. Yeah, yeah. Because that that time, was. And the first time was very true. Was very real. I thought it was just after. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. And that's why it is so. It's so. It, it really moved me when I saw that video because I was asking myself a couple of days before when I heard that, that Eddie passed away, I was thinking, wow, I hope that the, I wish they could have made peace. You know, I wish they could have, they could have uh, gotten back together and to hear 
uh, that they actually did behind the scenes, not talking about it, leaving out the public, and just clearing it, make me really happy because that those things matter more than anything else. It's like you know, from the from the outside point of view, fans and 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 they have a different opinion about what they think is important when it comes to a band. They like it when when a band makes a good tour and it's entertaining or they make a great album. Obviously, you know, it's very understandable that that's the point of view. But there's a deeper meaning behind all this, you know, and, and I think the, the mo most important thing for, for this Halloween kind of thing is, is really the forgive and forget kind of thing, to, 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 to forgive and really uh, be friends again. That's much more important than anything else. Nope, your, your dinner's ready. Oh. Yeah, that's Sasha, Sasha Gasman, he's sending me SMSs. There you go. Nice. Stop talking about us, we're, we're getting embarrassed, we're so great. <laughs> No, but, uh, you know, like you said, it's the New Age now, the first album of what has been called the New Age. Uh, uh, it's a great album. But, what, you know, what I take away from Halloween's career is the high consistency, the high quality. Every album is interesting. They're not duplicating. Even yeah. Chameleon had some interesting stuff on it for myself. Uh, how, what's the secret for Halloween's longevity and the, their high quality of musicianship and, and, and songs? It, we don't think that much when it comes to when you make an album because it doesn't make any sense. You can you should never try to to fulfill any other expectations than trying to do your best. But you you cannot even also with this album we did not sit down and make some sort of a pre-draft where it should go. You know it's just the way it sounds when the seven of us do something together. You have the songwriters. You have. You have Kai, when he writes a song and I sing it, it has a specific sound. When Andy writes the song and he sings it, it has a specific sound. Or when I sing a song of this, you know, it's like there's there's this um, variety. Of, uh, it's like we, we can do so many things now in, in, in various ways. But um, I honestly think the I, I felt the same way, by the way, because I was rejecting listening to to the records that I had done afterwards. The the the. Uh, Chameleon and Pink Bobbles phase was not a happy phase for the band. We were like, it was very difficult. When when Kai left the band, the whole balance was was destroyed. It was not working anymore. Somehow, Waiki and Kai they had a competition going now, and that was very fruitful. And as soon as he got replaced by Roland, even though the musicians were good, the spirit was not the same, and we were just constantly fighting. And then we also like got talked into taking Chris Sangaridis as a producer instead of Tommy Hansen, who was responsible for, for a lot of the fun stuff that went down on the Keeper record. It was a bad choice. It was just not a was just not a good thing to do. So we did the best out of the situations. We still wrote cool songs, but we didn't work as a band anymore. That's why I don't like... Uh, I mean, uh, Pink Bubbles Go Ape, we still did, but it started to be difficult. And on Chameleon, it was just three guys making a solo record. Like everybody oh, wow. made a solo record under the name Halloween, but we were not working together. It was not <laughs> a band anymore. And when Andy joined the band, it was exactly what the band needed. He brought the focus into the band. He he and and I was refusing listening to any of the stuff that they did, uh, you know, because of disappointment and hurt feelings. But now I can. It's like when we when we started. The, the the pumpkins united thing i was listening to like the the the, the, the master of the rings album and i understand why it worked because talking of van halen i think they did the same thing in, in their type of music they don't they did not copy the previous records they did not copy the keeper records but it sounded like halloween it was, it was kind of a reinvention of, of the band and that saved the band in my opinion i think we were not functioning anymore, regardless of what was right or wrong. The, the fact, it was, a, it was a fact that we were just fighting and we were not really, we didn't want to make music together anymore. That was the situation. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that's why, that's why we shouldn't, you know. And, and when Andy came back, the band was functioning again, you know. But it's, it's so great that we get all the suckers together, together now in this band and do this together. It's just amazing. very Halloween-like, really. Really, you, you know, I remember, I remember, uh, Wiki. He he said in an interview with me and maybe Alan that you know once the finances, the the the, the money started becoming an issue back in the eighties and nineties. That's when everything just sort of fell apart, you know. Yeah. And I mean, it's I, typical. It's just hum, human nature, right? When everybody, it's not so much the bands starting to think about money. You know, it was more the people around the band trying to get the biggest piece of the cake. 
Yeah. We were like, the band was like massively sucked into legal situations. You know, we were injuncted and stuff. You shouldn't have to think about things like that. Yeah. We were like so screwed. You, you couldn't imagine. We sold millions of records. We, we were selling out venues and we were in the debts. <laughs> Because, yeah. because that's what everybody was taking away. It's a typical situation. Musicians, typical. usually musicians are very naive, and they should be, because you should make music, and music needs a free mind. And, and business is, tired, is, is kind of trapping your mind. You know, it, if, you don't, if you don't free yourself from these traps, like becoming a businessman instead of a musician, you're done. You, like all the musicians that lose their inspirations and, and their creativity, it's all because that part took over. So you have to be in a constant, you have to make your money. That's the, that's the reality of our existence, unfortunately. Right. But you got to fight that fight to free your mind. Your, your, the, the creative process needs to be free from that as much as you can. And only as much as you are able to do that, you will succeed. And to answer, finally answer your question, the, the reason why the albums that they've done are always kind of strong and different is because I think this band, the songwriters of this band, Whitey, for instance, he, he can think financially. He can. He's not able to write anything else but whatever comes into his head, he makes a song out of it. It doesn't matter what it is. That that makes him special, you know. Kai Hansen, the same thing. He, he, he is just... He likes money, but he cannot write songs in a, in a specific direction. He just he just writes the songs, and he does it with such an uh, such an authority, or I don't know the English word for it. Uh, um, for him, it's it's uh, it's like so natural to do it like that that whatever he does, it kind of works. You know, it has it has some kind of a strength because of the conviction he has about the things he does, and I think that that makes this band and every good band. I, I believe functions that way. Everybody's different, but it's always that fight of not letting the business side destroying the artist, you know. And, and that's that's why you need managers. You need to have someone who takes care of that. And we do have that now. The whole band situation is wonderful. When when Kai and I got back into that family, we really needed to get used to a completely different situation than what it used to be in the 80s. In the 80s, we were surrounded by sharks. Yeah, People, yeah, I bet. They, they didn't care about you. They didn't care about us. The only thing they cared about was getting the biggest piece of the of the money that was coming. And they did. Yeah, they did. <laughs> in this this time now, everything is completely different. The management is on our side. You know, yeah, the they, way it should be. Yeah. We're part of the team now. And we really needed to get used to that. You know, when you have experiences like we did in the 80s, you, 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 you tend to be very suspicious. You know, you, you don't like other people like managers having too much to say, you know. And, and you, you, we needed to sort of uh, learn to trust in a new way again, or in a way that we never actually were able to trust because we have been... We have been fucked up so many times in the past, you know. It was a very difficult time, but it's part of the school that's called life. Yeah. No, and again, uh, I think this is classic. You know, every band that has a Rod Smallword or Peter Grant that says, guys, you make the music, I take care of the rest, yeah. the success comes with it. People mm -hmm. that are just digging around and want their piece of the pie, those bands are unfortunately in oh. debt by the time their careers are over. If you don't have that, if you don't have that, you're going to go down it's, it's going to destroy you because either way you either end up with nothing or you you, you end up being torn apart by by uh, by the base or you, your creativity dies it's so important to have jobs you know g given to the people and they take care of that and, you, and and musicians should not have to think about things like that you know? yeah so, so back back to the album i mean andy darris his voice has got so many textures in it and, and now, you know, you listen to Fear of the Falling, where you guys are blending, harmonizing. It just blows my mind, all these singers and the sounds. Uh, the orchestration, who's going to sing what? How, how, was, how did that come about? Like, who decides, hey, I'll take that part, you take this part? It was easy. It was actually very easy. I was having the same, same thoughts as, as you just had. You know, it's like, that's going to be difficult probably to figure it out or... Might even be an ego problem coming up, but it didn't. I mean, at least not with me and Andy. It was we had Dennis Ward being part of the the, the creative organizer 
but he was the, the, the creative organizer and, and co-producer with uh, Charlie. And Dennis knows my voice from Blas Van Dome and, and being with me in Unisonic. And of course, he knows Andy's voice. So we wanted to have someone outside of the band make a pre-draft who could maybe sing what. You know, it was not written in stone, but, you know, just to have a guideline. And that's what he did. He was he was spreading the parts, and that's how we started it. But it it was always when when I did something one evening, and I didn't feel a hundred percent sure about it. You know, next day I would get to Andy. You know, you should, you should give it a try. You know, see how that works. You know, I didn't I didn't I don't think I nailed it. You know, I think it was it needs wow. you. And the other way around it was the same thing. It happened that next morning. It was always pretty much the same kind of routine. I, I showed up at Andy's house in Tenerife, something like maybe 12, 1 o'clock, okay, in noon and afternoon. He's a very late sleeper. He's the, he's the opposite to me when it comes to his sleeping rhythm. He doesn't get out of the bed. He's probably now getting out of bed. <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's a night person, and I'm an early bird completely. Um, so we, we found a place in the middle. I, sh I usually showed up there like at 12, 1 o'clock or something. And then it, it happened that, that he came to me. You know, you should, you should. I, I was trying that song yesterday. And, and, and Charlie and I, we thought, you should, you should try that one. Or you should try this. Or you should sing a harmony over that. Or, you know, or Charlie thought that I should maybe try a harmony there. It was just all about the song. It was just all about getting the best out of the songs. And that's the way it should be, you know. No it, egos. No egos. It was the only little ego situation we had was with Kai. It was when when I did the vocals for Skyfall, I thought it was clear that that's the way it's supposed to be. Dennis had actually given me pretty much the parts that I'm doing now on, on the song was was how he thought it would happen. And we had a great night. You know, I had a glass of wine and we did the vocals for the song and everybody was happy. It sounded so cool. You know, it, it, it sounded like Keeper. It was it was about one of the <laughs> few songs that had a Keeper spirit. You know, and we were like, well, cool. That's so cool. Thank God he wrote that song because it's the only song Kai wrote. And we sent it out to the management. And everybody was like, ah, this is so cool, you know. And then and then Kai called up. Well, I thought I sing that song. <laughs> and it was like, it was like, it was like, uh, did you uh, not hear it? <laughs> yeah, it was, or you're not listening. You know, the thing is, we don't mind Kai singing. You know, he sounds cool. And there are certain things that you can do. And why not? You know, this is so crazy anyway. It doesn't really. But he, he it was the only song he did. You know, after centuries of not being part of the band, we joined the band. He writes one song. It's a killer song. A and song. it sounds like. Keeper, and I, I shouldn't sing it. You know, it was like I was a bit hurt. I was a bit hurt. It's like I, I felt like I, I agreed to it. Okay, fine, no problem. And he was happy. So he thought he would do the he would do the vocals. It would have sounded like Gamma Ray then, by the way. But it, it I, I was kind of I was kind of giving in to it. I said, okay, fine. And but I got really frustrated. I felt like I, I, I didn't know what was going on. It was like two days after that, I was miserable. I was like in a, in a very bad state, and I didn't know why. And I thought, I think it's because I'm hurt that he doesn't want me to sing his song. <laughs> and I, I, I told that to Jan Bayati and, and the manager. And he said, you know what? You should open up your mouth. You should talk about it. Yeah, you should don't suck worry. it in, you know, speak it out. And everybody in the band felt, felt differently than Kai. Everybody was really happy with it and thought it was a bad choice, you know, to do it like that. Because sometimes Kai has a problem. I love him to death, okay? We all do, but sometimes he has a problem seeing the big picture, you know, seeing the band. And uh, it's a matter of fact that Andy and I, as the singers, we do play a bigger role for, in terms of the career of this band. When you just look at numbers, you know, you, you can tell that the majority of fans, Kai has his fans, there's no doubt about it, but the majority of Halloween fans want to hear mainly me and Andy sing. And, and, and he, he just felt like, you know, he since he doesn't sing on other parts on the album, which we offered him, and he just didn't do it. You know, he just <laughs> there, there was more, like, stuff sent to him, and he just never did it. So it ended up him having almost nothing to sing on the album, which was not the plan in the beginning anyway. But later on, he wanted to be a singer too on it, and it, it's fine. 
but it was just not the right thing to do for this album. And everybody felt like this, the management, the producer, and the whole band. That was the only thing where we, where we tried to convince him that that's not the right way of doing it. And he, if he would have you know, stick with the idea that he should do it, he, he would have done it because we, we have this unwritten law, the songwriter needs to be happy. If that's the way he wants to do it, that's the way it's gonna happen. But thankfully, after a while, he understood it. And now he totally agrees. When, when the album, when the singer got number one in England, he, I, I got it recorded and I saved the audio files just as a proof. <laughs> he, he was sending me the sweetest message, message saying, oh, it's so, it's so exciting to see the, the bus that's going down and how people react to the song. And I'm sure it has something to do with you singing on the song. So it's like, in the future, I write the song and you sing. And, and then we make great things together. You know, yeah. I love it because it shows that, that he does understand, you know, it. Yeah. it matters. It matters to both do something together. It's not just him, you know. And it, it, it was really, really important for me. And I, I think it is it's also necessary. It's good that he can express that, you know. He's... It, it, it was it was a very important statement because, like I said earlier, I was a little hurt. I was a little hurt that that he didn't want me to sing on his only freaking song on the album. You know, Michael, I got I got to say, Skyfall to me is probably one of the greatest Halloween songs ever written. And I think because of I love the bridge when you know Kai comes in on the bridge and and Andy and you, it's it's like the perfect. And I yeah. love that it was like something like twelve minutes long. I just yeah. it just blew my mind. I go, it's it's better. It was. I wouldn't say it's like Keeper, but it's evolved from Keeper. But it's just yeah, it a knockout. A knockout. It it's has a spirit. It has a spirit. And and the way it is now, that's the way we wanted to do it right away. We didn't want Kai to sing nothing on it. We we had we had those parts he's doing. We wanted him to do it because it sounds great, you know, uh, the way he does it. And it also this is Pumpkins United, you know. So it's fine when when Kai also sings here and there. It's not it's not a problem. But it was for the song the way it is now. It just worked better. We, you know, the thing is, I did the vocals, and everybody was happy. And then, then he re, he did his vocals, and it wasn't better. You know what I mean? It was just the verses are not so much his cup of tea. It's a little high for him. You know, it was like he can only do the the the, the witch scream. You know, he he can do the witch up there, which is nice occasionally, but it was just not having the power. And it was, again, it was Andy Darius who was the game changer. Andy was was sticking out of the conversation the whole time. He was not saying anything. And, and, and we were all out of arguments. It was not a fight. Don't get me wrong. It was not a fight. We were just talking. You know, we were just trying to, to bring um, uh, arguments across why that's the way to do it. You know, especially with this first reunite, United record and stuff like that. And Andy was sticking out of it the whole time. He was not saying anything. And we were out of arguments. We were almost like, okay, then that's the way we got to do it, I'm, I'm afraid. And then Andy said, he, he said, he, he was sending an email. He was saying, oh, that's too bad. I really thought the song was so powerful the way it was with, with, with Michael singing it. But it's okay. We got a lot of other great songs. <laughs> And with that, <laughs> with that statement, he just got Kai's ego, you know. And Kai's okay, yeah, we, yeah, we, we do it the way you. <laughs> you gotta love Andy Darius. You gotta love Andy Darius. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Halloween's cashmere that song. I mean, you know, it, it's epic. So, but you know, your experience with Aventasia and all the different things. We were talking earlier about the the Quebec City show when this, uh, Toby got sick. When you got eight uh, lead singers in the band, it's easy to cover up, right? Did yeah. any of that experience kind of play into the, the, how you're orchestrating these songs and uh, divvying up the, the vocal parts? Well, at least I'm used to a situation like that. You know, that's definitely uh, something that I learned from Avantasia, that it is cool to have various vocalists, you know. It's not an unusual thing in the type of music anyway. I mean, think about Kiss. Kiss always had Gene Simmons and 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 uh, Paul Stanley as main singers, and it doesn't matter if you hear "I Was Made for Loving You," it's Kiss, or if you hear like the Creatures of the Night, or uh, I don't know, uh, uh, "I Love It Loud," for instance, from Kiss, it's mm. Gene Simmons, and it's Kiss because yeah. you used to, to those two singers, or like Lincoln Park, you know, you, you had the guy who was doing the rap stuff, and the other one who unfortunately killed himself, who did the the, the more melodic shouting kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, it's a, but with Halloween, it's a new situation because we always used to have one, and now both are in, in, in the game, or actually all three. Kai started to sing, then I joined the band, and then Amy, and now we all do it together. 
it has ma massive benefits life. Because when you do a three-hour show, and with the material that we have, oh. it's difficult to play short. You, you, you just you just have to. It, it'll always be something like two hours at least. We we we, we do the normally we would have done uh, a tour on our own, probably with no su support act or anything, you know. But since the pandemic was hitting, and and everybody is a little worried, you know, who knows how long it's going to take until people are not scared anymore and you, nobody knows nobody knows how many people are going to come up to the show so we teamed up with our friends from hammerfall not as a support act we, we like we they, they get the same stage size and everything they can have the, the whole set this is not they're not a support act you know we play second but this is a team you know we, we like uh, we, we do this together just to make sure that enough people come and when the pandemic is finally forgotten again then we, then we can do tours on our own again. But to come back to long shows, like making three-hour shows, like we did with Avantasia as well, it's amazing when you don't have to do this on your own. If you, if you do a three-hour concert with these type of songs on your own, I'm sure you're going to fuck yourself up, you know. Mm -hmm. But I only have to do, I mean, I share 50-50 with Andy anyway, and, and we share a little with Kai, who has a part in the middle and stuff like that. It's perfect. It's perfect. It's just one thing you gotta watch out. It's like when you don't sing, you mu you must watch out not to drink too much red wine backstage. <laughs> like like when you <laughs> because that's what we all tend to do. Not necessarily everybody drinks red wine, but I do. And it's so easy to get drunk when you when you have the, <laughs> you, know, you, you just want to stay in the mood and you, you drink something. And I had a situation. You 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 got to know that I I was completely anti alcohol my entire life. I didn't drink a drop of alcohol until 2009. No, 2010. Wow. When, and when I was supposed to record the vocals to the first Unisonic Sonic album, I was so stiff that I needed something. So I I kind of bought a a, a a Desperado, you know these the 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 the, the, the Desperado stuff, and it it, it, it kind of lose loosened me up so that I was able to to sing well. And I, I kind of I kind of like that, especially on stage. Not to be drunk, but to have a bit of red wine, it kind of gives that little extra kick to have a party yourself. Because if you the, the most important thing for a live concert of that type of music especially is you have to enjoy it yourself. If you are able to enjoy it yourself, the audience can. And sometimes that helps, but as like I said, in in those in those break phases when Andy is singing or Kai is singing, it's very dangerous because you just sit. <laughs> on the yes, side. Sir. <laughs> Michael, let me ask you the question that like you know so many people you know they looked at the song list, the track list, and they go, "How come Michael hasn't contributed like you know song wise? Did you have songs ready? Did you uh, you know did you want to maybe you didn't want to contribute? Maybe you thought there was just oh. enough good material there." I didn't. I didn't want to. I, I I I intentionally took got myself. I'm making a solo album right now, an acoustic album. You know, that's that's my creative part at the moment. But when it comes to the songs of Halloween, I have written a few songs that got that were successful. I know, but still, to me, Kai, YP, later on, Andy, and also Sasha. To me, they're the main songwriters. They write the songs that sort of define the, the main sound of the band. And since we have six songwriters, I thought it's enough. You know, I, maybe I do something for another record that we might do. I think it has something to do with the 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 the, the label boss from. Um, um, nuclear Blast. He is actually really after my solo record. He, he's yeah. really like a, a a big fan, which is always great. But I, I told him that I'm doing something like that. He's like, oh, I want to have it. I want to have it. I'm going to release it next year. And he wants me to, to to continue. And I think because I was complaining to Ute, who is actually doing the promotion, that I I'm, I'm completely off the recording of the album because I'm just doing interviews for weeks. <laughs> And I, I think I think uh, that must have made its way to to uh, Mr. Steiger, I guess, because yesterday she said, "Yeah, from next week on you'll be free." You know, like, is, your soul, is your soul album completed? Is it done? I have all the material. I mean, I'm I'm. Uh, it's it's not going to be. Uh, it's going to be fifty fifty. It's going to be uh, like uh, a few of my own songs that I have, all just acoustic, but I will also record some of my favorite songs 
non-metal tunes, it's stuff from various bands that I that I that I do my own take on, you know, uh, um, some sometimes even from the '70s or whatever, just songs that I love, and I feel like. I, I can sing him in, uh, in an interesting way and, and do my own thing. It's, it's going to be 50-50, but it's going to be very simple, very, very uh, uh, acoustic. And, uh, everything just recorded here in my place. Okay, good. Right. And again, you've been very generous with your time. So anything else you want to promote? You got your solo album out? Uh, I guess yeah. we're all waiting for a tour. Uh, yeah, all that. But it's like, it's, I, I want to say something else. People should over should really overcome the fear part of uh, of the pandemic. I, I'm not saying it's a hoax. I'm not saying it's a lie. You know, I'm I'm not one of those. Um, you you gotta take care of each other. You know, you you, you gotta um, follow the rules to protect others and whatever. But don't be afraid. You know, this is this is the more you are afraid, the easier you get it because that's going to weaken your immune system. There's there's certain laws, moral laws. They're, they're much higher than the forces of nature. When it comes to egotistic fear, because fear is always just the ego. You just look at it. Someone who is fearless is, is very often um, selfless. Selflessness makes you fearless. And, and, and to overcome a situation like that, you have to develop you know, some kind of heroic spirit. You know, if you, yeah, you, 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 you got to be you got to be fearless. Of course, caring about others, but the selfish fear that the people always just, oh, I could get infected, you know, and looking at everybody like in the medieval ages, you know, it's like someone who has the, uh, is possessed by the devil or has whatever they had, the, 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 the diseases in those years, uh, in those centuries. I mean, it is very weak. It is very small. It's very little. We got to be bigger than that. We, I think it's part of the lesson of this pandemic. It's usually the opposite to what most of us do. I think it has a lot to do with getting closer together morally as a humanity, because this this affects the whole world. It has nothing to do with nations. Every country deals with it in a slightly different way. But seeing things like that can only be overcome by being fearless and, and caring about each other and actually understanding that we're one. We, this this. This thing, I honestly think it is, it is a, it's a lesson for becoming close, for getting closer to each other, and to to actually overcome a lot of the demons of the past. Because you, you can see out of the situation so much ugly things, so many ugly thing, things are coming to the forefront politically. I mean, the media is ridiculous. I mean, you you, you can see like the the so-called news. They're just feeding fear. It's all they do. It's just just negative information. It's so weak. It's so lame, you know. And, and one of the main thing we we got to learn out of that is is we got to be bigger than that. We really have to be. It's, it's it's so so little. What 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 most of the of, of the of the the people that you actually see in public um, um, are, are are living. You know, it's like. Uh, I mean, but then again, you only see the bad stuff. You know, you, it's like if, if someone does something very brave or something very beautiful, usually you don't see that because the negative thing is the better headline, you know? Yeah, that's yeah. what I was going to say. I was you get about three minutes thing. of that on a one hour newscast and the bad news for 57 minutes. I agree. And the headlines so are always starts, misleading. It all starts this new age with Pumpkins United. <laughs> Check <laughs> out uh, Michael. That's what he wants. That's what he's promoting. And, uh, Hey man, we're, this is a great album. I think everybody should rush out and get it. You will not be disappointed if you're a Halloween fan. So, Michael, yeah. also your your solo album. Just quickly, when do you think you're gonna have it ready? The, do you mean my my yes, album? Yeah, your solo album. When is that gonna be ready or released? Wants to, I mean, he's. Uh, I I want to take the time, uh, but he's he he wants to release it uh, when we do start the tour next year, which is uh, um, which is planned around April March. Mm -hmm. April, May, no, March, April, end of end of uh, March, something like that. I don't know if that's going to happen because I'm certainly going to take my time. You know, um, it's it's all about catching the right moment. The songs are there. It's like yeah. I'm recording. Sometimes I'm recording a song with one acoustic guitar live, and I, mm -hmm. I want to have that moment if I feel like that's that's a cool take. That's that's what I'm after, really. You know, um, but it's going to be released next year for sure, yeah. and. You know, one, 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 one thing, 
um, uh, at the end, I would like to say that we, we, we will all probably appreciate a lot of things in a very different way when this is finally over. You, you know, just to be able to get together with others, may that be a concert or wherever it is, like, like how, how many ever, you know, you, you, to be able to get together with other people without having to think about things and, and, and to be able to go to concerts again without worrying and restrictions and all, all that. I think when, when that's back, I think we, I hope we will yeah. appreciate it more. I think so too. Those are great words of wisdom. Thank you so much, Michael, for being on the show. Sure. Anytime. It was, it was great fun. A real pleasure. Thank you for your time. And uh, again, what a fantastic album. I'm looking forward to uh, many more in the future. So, And it, it, it's going great, I tell you. It's like, uh, I, I'm not allowed to say it and I won't, but it's, uh, we have, we have uh, um, a chart position over here that we never had before. You're allowed to say that. Why can't you say that? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good thing to say. Well, no. It's not official yet, you know. But... Oh, okay. All right. It's, it's yeah. coming. It's yeah. coming. All right. Well, thank you again, Michael. It's been great. And uh, yeah, we should do this more often. <laughs>